Hey everybody, Russ Barkley here with your weekly research update. So I hope everything's going well for you. It certainly is here now that I'm nearly over my cold and flu and we are moved into our new home here. So thanks. No dad joke for you today. Uh, I'll get back to those a little bit later. Thought maybe you were getting a little tired of them. So in this week's research roundup, I'm going to talk about four articles I thought out of the more than 15 or so that were published four articles that I thought were noteworthy. So we're going to begin with this article that appeared in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders. Uh, and it is a large study out of the United Kingdom on the relationship between threatened miscarriage, which means there was the possibility that a woman might miscarry during pregnancy and was showing signs of that, and the risk for ADHD and autism spectrum in the offspring of those threatened miscarriages. And they followed the children of those uh, pregnancies up to about 14 years of age. So very interesting study because uh, not only did it use a large population from the UK, which is great, it also looked at the kids at ages 5, 7, 11, and then 14 years of age. And then it looked at the risk of ADHD given that a mother did or did not have a threatened miscarriage. Now, this study involves more than 18,000 pregnant women and their babies. And among those, about 1,100 of those women, so about 6%, had experienced a threatened miscarriage during that pregnancy. They went on and followed the children up, as I said, and what they found is that if there had been a threatened miscarriage, the odds were 55% higher that the baby would go on to have autism spectrum and 51% higher that that baby would go on at some point in those 14 years to get a diagnosis of ADHD. So both neurodevelopmental disorders are elevated in women who have a threatened miscarriage. Now, while it seems, once again, that this looks like a causal relationship between miscarriage threat and risk of neurodevelopmental disability, it is just a correlation. We can just as easily argue for the flip side of the relationship. That is, women who are carrying babies that have neurodevelopmental disabilities or risk of such have a higher likelihood of miscarriage. And we know that women who have babies or fetuses during pregnancy that are in some way experiencing some kind of malformation do have a somewhat higher rate of miscarriage. So uh, again, not sure which way this is going. Could have to do with bad pregnancies, increased risk for ASD and ADHD. Could be the reverse. So more research as needed, as we often say. Next up is a review that appeared in the journal Comprehensive Psychiatry. This is a review of the effect that stress might have on mediating the brain alterations that are often found associated with ADHD. And as the authors point out, stress has been identified in some research as a risk factor for ADHD. We know that. We also know that Brain activity and physiology in ADHD is different, is modified from what we see in typical kids. Then recent studies on stress do suggest they might produce some kind of CNS alterations. And does that lead to ADHD? Well, we don't know because this review went on to point out that while they were able to find 20 studies that looked at this relationship, the evidence they provided for any of these stressors being linked to brain malformations that are linked to ADHD was weak at best, certainly not providing strong evidence. So it's mainly due to using very small samples, not using appropriate statistical analyses, uh, and so on. So we can't argue, they say, that stress provides some kind of mediating role in causing the brain malformations that lead to ADHD. So Dr. Matei and others who argue that stress and trauma can lead to these brain alterations, 
need to take note of this. The evidence is not especially strong at this time. Just as important as they point out is that kids who have ADHD are more likely to have been exposed to stressors during their pregnancies, following their pregnancies, during their deliveries, for instance, later on in early childhood. And so, as I always point out to you, correlation is not cause. We can't argue that one leads to the other, even though some people want to argue that stress causes ADHD. By the way, the stressors they looked at were early life traumatic events, institutionalization, prenatal smoking, maternal alcohol consumption, air pollution, low socioeconomic status, low birth weight, among others. And while children with ADHD are prone to have associations with all of those stress exposures, that doesn't mean that the stress exposures led to the ADHD. And again, as I pointed out, it could just as easily be vice versa. But here's a review suggesting we can't draw any conclusions about these early life stress events and exposures and them causing ADHD. Okay, next up, very important study in my opinion. This was done using the records from the Department of Veterans Affairs here in the United States following a very large sample of veterans who were diagnosed with ADHD and who were given stimulant medication. And because the data set is large and they track these individuals over time, they can compare these people to when they took their medication versus to the times they weren't taking their medication. So on and off, it's what we would call a within subject control group, which is very good because it helps to control for other possible confounding factors. And what the study found was that in the months that these veterans were taking stimulant medication for their ADHD, they had a significantly reduced likelihood of completed suicides than during the months that they didn't take their medication. So we know, and I've talked about it here on this channel and other videos, that ADHD predisposes to a much higher risk for suicide, particularly during the adolescent and young adult years. And while there's somewhat of an elevation during childhood, it starts to ramp up as we move into the high school years, say ages 14 to 19, and even continues somewhat beyond that. The earlier studies showed that it is depression with ADHD that makes people think about suicide. So depression leads to ideology, but it is the impulsiveness in ADHD that leads to the likelihood of an attempt and of a worse attempt and of a more successful attempt at suicide than is the case in non-impulsive individuals. So it really is this relationship with inhibition that is the predictor of these attempts and successes. So no surprise then, months that we treat ADHD and control that impulsivity are months in which the risk of suicide mortality are significantly less. Yet another benefit of medication for people with ADHD, particularly if they have comorbid depression. The final paper up is on criminal convictions in men and women with ADHD. This is a large study of the Swedish population. As you can see here, it involved over 600,000 men, 600,000 females, uh, and they looked at ADHD diagnosis uh, and prescription rates of medication. Uh, and then they went on to look at criminal convictions within the Swedish court records. And what they found is that those with ADHD, as we know, had a higher risk of conviction for both violent and nonviolent crimes than did those without ADHD. But they reported some interesting sex differences. And that is that while criminal convictions were more frequent among males with ADHD, females exhibited higher rates of relative risk for violent and nonviolent offenses. Whether they went on to be convicted of them, 
the women were committing more of these acts than the men, the men were more likely to be convicted. They did find that some other variables were marginally related to this risk of conviction. Obviously, being in low socioeconomic status, we know, is related to crime, not just in ADHD, but in other populations. What they did find is that substance use disorder was a major factor in increasing the risk for a conviction further than just the risk of ADHD alone. So those two together elevate the risk even further. And we've seen that in earlier studies as well, where once an individual with ADHD goes on to develop, say, conduct disorder or antisocial behavior, they're more likely to get into substance use. And if they get into substance use, it further elevates their risk of antisocial behavior. And that is certainly something that they saw here for both males and females. So uh, a very important study that continues to emphasize this relationship between ADHD and criminal activity. By the way, just so you know, although the relationship is there, our studies indicate that it's usually about 25% or more of people with ADHD who move into serious, repetitive, antisocial behavior, uh, and that may lead to these convictions. But uh, they are certainly more likely to do so than the general population. Well, okay, there you have it. That's this week's roundup of research. Hope you'll join me again next week for another research roundup. I'll also be periodically dropping videos on specific topics related to ADHD. So it's good to be back up and online with you. And I look forward to seeing you in future postings on my channel. Thanks, everybody, and be well.